Hey everybody, KC here. So I am in Woo Sox Park. This is the home of the Worcester Red Sox. And it is a uh, Boston Red Sox AAA affiliate. And it, this is its first year in Worcester. They used to be in Pawtucket. And one of the things they did when they built this park, it is Polar Park, the naming rights went to Polar Water, which is right, one of the local companies. One of the things they wanted to do is innovate in a number of different ways. So they worked with a company called Standard uh, Cognition. And I reported on Standard Cognition a few years ago because they were one of the companies that was looking at the Amazon Go uh, no checkout, no uh, um, technology, and they wanted to bring it to other companies. Well, they're doing it working with a lot of retailers. This, as far as I can tell, is the first sports venue where they've actually put in a, uh, a store, okay, for food and beverages that is actually gonna use checkout free technology. Now in some ways it's very similar to uh, what they do at Amazon Go. If you look up at the ceiling, that's where the cameras are and that, are that are gonna be tracking movement and being able to track SKUs. Now, the interesting thing is, as I stand here right now, the uh, checkout free technology isn't working. Well, it's not that it isn't working, they're actually in the trial phase. Those cameras are tracking people's movement and tracking SKUs, but it's learning. And it's gonna be sometime in August that the, uh, the technology will come alive and people will be able to come in here and buy product using an app. Okay, they download the app, same thing as with Amazon Go. They put in their credit card, they'll be able to take things and walk out without um, without having to go through any kind of a checkout stand. And listen, if you've ever been to a, any kind of stadium or ballpark, you know that, oh man, the lines could be long. This is a way of reducing that friction. It's also really interesting, one of the things they've done here is they've been very conscious of local companies. So if you look at all, this is a beer selection, and it's all, almost all beers from local vendors. Uh, they're local, find local companies, local brew pubs, and they are basically you know, providing much of the beer that's for sale here in the store. And then if you look over there, in the beverages section, the cold beverages section, basically those are items that are, that are being sold by Polar. In terms of having a local orientation, one of the other things that they did here is they put in a kosher section. So they have a section of kosher certified food for, for, for the large Jewish population that lives in the Worcester area. Listen, this is, this is only about 1,700 square feet, but the potential is enormous in terms of how they're gonna be able to use this technology, expand it to other places in the park, maybe even the ticket taking uh, uh, function. And what they're going to be able to do is, they're going to, I think they're going to be able to generate an enormous amount of data about their customers, which will allow them to serve those customers better. And that's the subject of my Zoom interview with Dr. Charles Steinberg, who is the, uh, is the, is the president of the, uh, the Worcester Red Sox. Really, really interesting guy, and I hope you enjoy our conversation. So, Dr. Charles, welcome to Morning Newsbeak. Well, uh, thank you. I, I, I have so many questions I want to ask you, but the first one I want to ask you is what? Tell me the story about what your backdrop there, all those guitars. Well, I think that um, uh, one of the definitions of our approach and my career uh, is the union of baseball and music, uh, the entertainment uh, that we've provided in the ballpark for uh, uh, nearly 50 years uh, has been um, uh, that intertwining just so. Uh, I'm a Beatle at heart. Uh, there's a, a somewhat of a replica of a Paul McCartney bass, but it's right-handed. Uh, Fender made a 100th anniversary guitar uh, for Fenway Park. Uh, that's a, a John Lennon replica, Rickenbacker, uh, as well as my own um, uh, acoustics. And that one over there was a gift from James Taylor to name drop. How about that? Oh, that's cool. I, I just apropos of nothing, my wife and I have been on a on a tear of going to see people like that. So we saw McCartney play Madison Square Garden. We saw James Taylor and 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 um, uh, play uh, Madison Square Garden. Uh, it's 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 great to kind of catch up with these acts. It, I mean, they're in the autumn of their careers, I suppose. But then again, right. so am I. So uh, catalogs. 
But they both, Paul McCartney, and um, who played at Fenway Park, and James Taylor, who's played many times at Fenway Park and who has now sung at Polar Park, uh, have been, um, their, their catalogs have been instrumental, uh, excuse the pun, uh, with our orchestration of musical energy mm -hmm. uh, uh, at, with all the ballparks that we've been associated with. Yeah, that's totally cool. So tell me about Polar Park. So you're, this is your first year in Polar Park. You're in Worcester after the team being in Pawtucket, Rhode Island for a long period of time. 50 years. And, and one of the things you did, I don't want to, I'll, I want to get to the lead in terms of my audience first, which is you're putting together this new ballpark. What possessed you to create a store that is basically going to have checkout free technology as it, once it finally all kicks in? Um, four words, Larry Lucchino, Matt Levin. Um, Larry Lucchino is well known. Uh, he'll be, uh, he'll be going to the baseball hall of fame someday. Uh, and Larry, when he has built ballparks, uh, starting with Camden Yards plus Petco Park in San Diego, fixing, saving Fenway Park uh, in Boston, building JetBlue Park in Florida, now Polar Park, um, like a real artist, he does not want to replicate what he has done before. It's always going to be new. It's always going to be different. And he charged us with having an innovative ballpark, a technologically innovative ballpark. Worcester is a dynamic city who has uh, given birth to more inventions than you would realize, uh, from the commercial Valentine to the rocket, uh, the liquid fuel rocket engine of Goddard um, to the pill. So it, it uh, the monkey wrench, white chocolate, uh, the smiley face. So Worcester is a city of invention and Larry wanted a ballpark that resonated with that while also inscribing the next chapter in uh, the ballpark experience. Uh, that brings us to my friend and colleague, Matt Levin, who uh, has a fan sensibilities like Larry and I do, um, but also a uh, technological acumen so that he can marry marketing visions to enhance the fan experience with technological innovation. And it was he, who believed we could get to uh, an autonomous uh, checkout system. And um, you know, looked at Amazon, but then found uh, the David to uh, Amazon's Goliath uh, in Standard Cognition, a, um, a high-tech company that was uh, right for the challenge and ripe for the challenge. And um, the Woosox market uh, now has cameras that are rehearsing, they're practicing um, so that you can walk in Take what you want and walk right out. I mean, it seemed to me one of the one of the um, things that appealed to me about it when I saw it is that when it's all finally up and running, it's going to remove a tremendous amount of friction from the experience. I mean, any fan has had the experience of saying, "I'm going to go get a beer and a hot dog," and then you miss, you know, the home run, right? Because you're waiting online. And it seems to me that one of the things that you go in, you leave, and it all happens very quickly, which is terrific. It's, it's fine for that 30-year-old fan who, uh, who may fit a demographic that you're describing. I'm equally uh, excited for what it does for the, the mom who's got a four-year-old and a seven-year-old. Right. And the, uh, the excursion to the ballpark is filled uh, with a checklist of what I've got to do and what I've got to take. And if you t say to that mom, that instead of the four-year-old and seven-year-old uh, sit, stand and squirmy in a concession line, they can just walk in, grab their snack, grab their polar seltzer, uh, grab a sandwich, be in, be out, be back at the seat. I think you've just relieved subconscious stress uh, from mom or dad or grandma, uh, and you have made the food part of the experience so much more comfortable for families. And this park has as its purpose, uh, the regeneration of love of baseball and ballparks by children. That is the contribution we hope to make, we need to make uh, to the game of baseball. Yeah, and the way, when I talked to Matt, he, one of the things he explained to me is the, while this is in the, the food market at the moment, 
he's hoping that it could be expanded to where you buy your hats and your t-shirts, potentially even to the, to the, uh, the entry experience to the ballpark, that the yes. idea of removing friction wherever possible. But it also occurred to me that one of the things that it does is it actually gives you access to a lot more data. If I go up to the, 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 if I go to buy a hot dog and a beer and I just pay with cash or even a credit card, you're probably not getting a lot of data on me. But if you start to develop, a, you know how often I go to the ballpark, what I'm buying, you can actually market to me much more effectively during the season and even during the off season. Well, I think that's true. It's a secondary benefit. Uh, and what is a primary benefit is we want to provide the goods that people want. And we want to make it easy and seamless. Um, you know, Larry Lucchino says, it's amazing how much smarter you seem when you listen to your fans. <laughs> well, and I will say one of the things that when I went to the ballpark to, to, to watch the game is I was told I would not even be able to see you to the fifth or sixth inning because you were spending the first four or five innings just walking around talking to people. Well, that's how you know. We are fans. You know, I'm, I'm uh, certainly not uh, averse to going and, and try and uh, that Hebrew national hot dog that we have at the concession stand uh, to see what the line is like, what's the experience like, how friendly is the concessions person, uh, how available is the mustard? Um, it, you know, do, does it come in a variety of mustards or is it just yellow mustard? We're, we're fans, we've always been fans. I think that's all we really are. The um, when I when I go to the idea of knowing more about your customers, that sort of takes me to the next subject that I wanted to talk to you a little bit about, which is that as I when I was reading your biography and the various teams that you've been with, one of the things that really stuck out to me, and it seems to me this has got to be so applicable in Worcester, is you have made being part of that community, creating community around the team, and also reaching out to the community sort of a core, it, it seems like as a core part of what you have brought to every team that you've been with. It's, um, there's no greater passion than that. Uh, but it, you're part of what your, um, your experience has, has taught you. And when I was growing up in Baltimore, it just felt like the Orioles were always going to be there for you. The Baltimore Orioles under Jerry Huffberger, the owner of the team, had a reputation of class doing things right, treating people well. If someone was in need, uh, they, they helped. And I had firsthand experience as a fan, um, I guess three times before I ever got my internship, um, I went twice before I got my internship. Uh, one time uh, I wasn't going to be able to go to back to school night and get those book covers. And I was um, sad about that and uh, my mother, may she rest in peace, took out the phone book, looked up Baltimore Orioles and said, now, why don't you call them? And I called them. They asked me to write a letter. I didn't think anything would happen. I, I got book covers in the mail and I realized that the Baltimore Orioles weren't just players and wasn't just a company, but it was people. And um, uh, once uh, my best friend and I uh, accidentally exited the ballpark, couldn't get in, bought bleacher tickets just to get back in. But we went to the office. I didn't know what a public relations office was. We got to come to another game. I got to see Hank Aaron play for the Milwaukee Brewers. And the more you looked around the city, you, you the more you saw that the players and the organization were there for you. So you're a product of your environment. And when I got to work for the Orioles and got to be part of uh, reaching out for the community, um, it's it's very gratifying. And then Larry Lucchino took it up to a new level when he walked out of Camden Yards one day with me and said, look, everything we're doing is making headlines. We are a phenomenon. If we sneeze, it's the top of the fold in the Baltimore sun. We need to think of a community relations project for which we're known. Something, he said, look, you do 10,000 things for 10,000 people. And that's fine, keep doing it. But there should be something central for which we're known. He said, look, up in New England, uh, the Boston Red Sox are associated with the Jimmy Fund. Everybody knows it, we need something. You're from Baltimore, figure out what it is. 
And that launched a wonderful study um, to look at what was ailing Baltimore. And uh, my conclusion was the, the number one issue was that the terrible nightly story of another drug-related murder in East Baltimore or West Baltimore of a young person was not a hate crime. It was a business crime because of the prevalent drug business. And I understood why these uh, bright young students were getting into that business. The cash was there and the dream of a college education um, wasn't as clear. And uh, all of that led to the establishment by the time we got to the San Diego Padres of the Padre Scholars, college scholarships for middle schoolers, um, Red Sox scholars, college scholarships for middle schoolers, Paw Sox scholars, college scholarships for middle schoolers. And now we've just welcomed our first class of Woo Sox scholars, uh, college scholarships for middle schoolers in the city of Worcester. Uh, but th th that's a marquee program, but you do try to do so much. We do uh, um, a lot, as much as we can for uh, cancer awareness, particularly childhood cancer awareness. I didn't know that gold was the color of childhood uh, cancer awareness uh, in September uh, and, until a mom helped me understand that. Um, and I think that uh, what we do to promote uh, in the community, the playing of ball, diamond sports, baseball, softball, wiffle ball, kickball, throw ball, street ball, you name it. Um, that's, that's good. And uh, recognizing where we are in society now, uh, we are creating a social justice platform, all of which uh, the Wu Sox Foundation can galvanize and unify and, and really put forth um, some major efforts for change while still doing 10,000 things for 10,000 people. Do you think of it, and I'm going to use a word that I, I some will think I'm, uh, it's negative, but I don't think so at all. It's about creating really a brand, right? It's a, establishing a brand identity, to not, me, in the, not in a manipulative sense of that word, but in the best sense of that word. To me, that's downstream. That's oh. what happens. That's the derivative. You do these things with no... Uh, business and marketing labels. We, we didn't even use the word marketing. We didn't even use the word public relations. And we certainly didn't use the word brand. Um, when you go back and analyze what you have done and you say there's a consistent uh, tone, a consistent voice, a consistent style as you try to build an enduring good name, then you then go back and say, oh, that's your brand. Right. But for it to be authentic, for it to be organic, for it to be sincere, for it to be raw and real, I think you start with what are the issues we need to tackle? What are the good deeds we need to do? You then, after some body of work, can go back and analyze it and say, oh, that's our brand. Hmm. I've never in my uh, career worked at saying in advance, what should our brand be? Um, and therefore let's do it because what we do comes from the heart. Um, this is not a terribly intellectual game despite uh, all of the talk about uh, Saber metrics. Look, uh, Earl Weaver was the father of Saber metrics uh, unwittingly uh, because um, of the statistics that he used and that I did for him. And to this day, I still write with a medium point blue big pen because that's how I did uh, Earl stats. You can over intellectualize, pseudo intellectualize this game and you know go ahead and knock yourself out. But it's a game of heart. And that's that's really what you want to put your energies into. Then you can go back and say, oh, that was good marketing. Oh, that was a good brand. But deal with the reality first and then apply your appellations to it later. Hey, listen, I'm, by the way, I'm with you on baseball being a game of heart. I'm a Mets fan. I'm not, and we have playing for us this season, the replacements for the replacements. So it's like, it's all, it's all heart. You know, it's, it's amazing. Is it, it, it was hard for the Mets in 1962. <laughs> yes. Absolutely. And people still love them. Right. Um, 
That's right. They did. Think about that. Yes, absolutely. Is it is it different or harder for a minor league team than it is for a major league team? Simply because, I mean, if you're a if you're the Boston Red Sox, you've got your team and you can market around personalities and your high performers and that sort of thing. But if you're a minor league team and you have any somebody who's any good, they're leaving. So is it a different, is it, do you come at it differently in terms of not just the things you were just talking about, but also creating this, the, the, the stadium experience, understanding you know, that's gotta be great. You know how on your car radio, you have a dial for the bass and a dial for the middle and a dial for the treble. Mm -hmm. They all combine, but you may put them at different levels. All, ball clubs, whether you're major league, minor league, have a baseball team. That is one asset you have, one product, if you will. All have a venue, regardless of how good your team is, how transient the players are, or what time of year it is. And all have a fan experience, whether you have great players, whether you have a, a cool uh, old ballpark like Fenway or a new ballpark like Polar Park. But the fan experience is a product too, both in the ballpark and in the community. In Major League Baseball, you love when you have the continuity of stars who can help you uh, enhance your good name. Uh, I'm a unabashed uh, Xander Bogarts fan. Uh, but I also love Mookie Betts and Jackie Bradley Jr., you know, and they're not with the Red Sox now, but I love them just the same. Uh, I love David Ortiz, you know. Brooks Robinson is still my hero. So the, the, um, the baseball players are an asset. Yes, in the minor leagues, by the time you fall in love with a player, he may have gone up. In Pawtucket, we had Rafael Devers for a week, you know, uh, but Jaron Duran has given Worcester a first half that they're going to remember. Uh, and let's see what becomes of Jaron Duran. But that's one asset. Whether you're at Camden Yards or, or Petco Park or Fenway Park or Polar Park, your venue is an opportunity. Whether the team is good or bad, whether the team is playing or not playing, whether it's in season or off season, that gives you an opportunity to really influence people. And then the fan experience, uh, how you get, how the kids uh, can enjoy themselves on a playground or with Smiley Ball or with the bird or with Wally or, or with the Swinging Friar. The, um, the, the fulfillment you get from going to see this game or enjoy this experience. No matter whether the team wins or loses, which you don't control, no matter which venue it is, that is a, a product too. So dial up the, the buttons on your radio. Yes, we may have to not be so emphatic about, oh, watch what players we have, because they may be gone before you know it. But the venue is pretty strong and the fan experience you try to control. So that those are the three that blend together to give you the orchestration and the music of the fan experience. Somebody told me that one of the standing, I don't know if you'd call it an order or instructions at Polar Park is if anybody who works there sees a kid, let's suppose a kid drops his ice cream cone. This is the example that was given to me. That whoever the person is, is, in, is empowered to say, come on, I'm gonna get you a new one. I mean, just. Yeah, well, that's the, that's the example I gave to our event staff in an opening video, because you know how you would feel. You know how you would feel if you were six years old and you dropped your ice cream cone. You know how you would feel if you were the 36 year old dad of the six year old. Right. Yeah. Give them another ice cream cone. No, it's, it's, it's not brain surgery, but it's, it's a not. So many businesses don't think that way. How can that be? Well, it's, it can be. <laughs> and by the way, clean up in section 12, there's yeah. an ice cream cone. Yeah. Keep your ballpark clean. 
So give me, a, if you can, just uh, real quickly, I, you've been very generous with your time and I appreciate it. Sense of the minor leagues right now. I mean, I guess there's, there's, there are changes. Some teams have been, uh, the, I know I was a fan of the, both the New Haven Ravens and the Bridgeport Bluefish. Now they're gone. Um, you know, are the minor leagues as, as, as thriving as they were a, a few years ago? I mean, there's been some winnowing of the teams. What's the state of the minor leagues right now? Well, I think what you're seeing is um, a unification. There was a striation before. Uh, I had spent all of my career in Major League Baseball. I had worked for the Commissioner of Baseball. And you were focused on the 30 clubs. Right. And there was Minor League Baseball. And you were, you were focused on the 160. And then there was the interface. Now what you're seeing from uh, Commissioner Manfred is a unification where it's one baseball, which it always really was, now wasn't it? Yeah. And you're seeing college baseball and um, little league baseball and AAU all be one. So you're watching that uh, that that part of, um, of of development take place, uh, and and you'll see how that sifts out, but. The uh, what one friend of mine said that um, the solution to baseball is more baseball. So if if more kids are playing baseball, if boys are playing baseball, now girls are definitely playing baseball and softball. Uh, you're going to see that it shapes out in a way that you hope is good for baseball, good for the game, good for diamond sports. Yeah. Um, we we love all the diamond sports and. You know, soccer's doing well. Well, maybe teach those kids who like to kick a ball the joys of kickball, which is a diamond sport. And that way they can enjoy soccer, but they can also enjoy watching baseball. Um, we're seeing in Worcester uh, a very um, substantial cricket community. Well, let's 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 take a look at how we're related. Yeah. You know, there's a bat, there's a ball. So. Um, I think that you're seeing a lot, I think in a post COVID atmosphere, people are appreciating fresh air, uh, green grass, uh, fun dirt, uh, teams again, kids playing together, uh, kids not uh, uh, glued only to their cell phones or to their uh, devices. Um, and I think that uh, baseball is well positioned to welcome all of these kids and say, yeah, we've got a wholesome game for you that's healthy and fun. And don't worry about this too much, kids, but you're learning great lessons of life and sportsmanship. Yeah. Well, you're playing my song. I, I, I love to quote the uh, the Boston Red Sox fan and, and Boston author Robert B. Parker, who once said that baseball is the most important thing that doesn't matter. <laughs> it's such a, such a great quote i would be I, before i let you go real quickly how do you you're you've been a baseball a long time how do you feel about things like seven inning double headers and starting the 10th inning with a guy on second base and maybe moving the mound how, how do you feel about stuff like that you know if again if you believe that you're smarter than that which has happened you're gonna be humbled game will will do that uh, the game uh, severely punishes uh, arrogance and those who can um, say, oh, I know how that would go. Um, instead, you approach it with humility and say, all right, let's try that. It may not have been what I thought of. Um, I've watched the the, ten inning, the 10th inning start with the runner on second. And yes, it jolted me, but it wasn't bad. Yeah. I'm not sure whether I want it, but it wasn't bad. Are we going to bunt the runner to third, get a runner on third with one out and get a sacrifice fly? Oh, that's an advantage. Well, it's the same advantage for the other team. Um, it may protect and preserve our 33-inning uh, game in Pawtucket as the longest game in, in history. But, you know, so, right, so you try that. You know, and a lot of times you try things at spring training and you try them in the minor leagues and then you see what you think. Um, the, the designated hitter was tried in uh, spring training, um, maybe for a couple of years. Back then they called it the designated pinch hitter. Nice. So you've got training grounds to see whether you like it. I think minor league baseball is a great crucible for that. 
and, and then you see whether you want to bring it to the majors. But don't be too sure about saying no until you tried it and then see what you think. All right, I'm chastened because I because my first reaction was no. How do you feel about how do you feel about banning the shift? That I don't like because I think that the shift is beatable by the hitter who beats it and more credit to that hitter. Why would you why why would you take away a defensive advantage when all the hitter has to do is like I like I could do it. It's not that I could do it, but the skillful hitter beats the shift. Right. And so promote the skill of the hitter. There aren't going to be any shifts anyway if a hitter can spray the ball. Now are there? No, true. Hey, listen. I I always wonder why if a, if if everybody's on the right hand on, on the right hand side of the infield, if the all the all the hitter has to do is twice is lay down a bunt down the third baseline, they're never going to shift on him again. And and we make that sound easy. I know it's hard. I I, I, but, I couldn't do it either. But you, know? you encourage me to think that um, that had I had a third hit in little league after my two that I got in two years, maybe a shift would have been just what I needed because I might have been able to bunt a ball and I won't say beat it out, but I might have been able to slog my way uh, down that first base line before a shortstop would run over and retrieve a ball while a third base was playing second. Dr. Charles, this has been terrific. I think there's all sorts of lessons in here for a, a largely retailer supplier audience. Um, I love your ballpark. I think your team is terrific. And uh, as I think I said to you at one point, you're probably going to be the only person who ever appears on Morning Newsbeat with five world championship rings. So, well, that may be. You know, and I, and I love your guitar collection. So, thanks so much for doing this. I appreciate it. And, well, and good luck this good luck this season and, and going forward. Thanks very much. Great to talk to you.